Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Yvonne here from My Halal Kitchen. I have a really special guest for you today. Sumaya Ham Hamdi of Halal Travel Guide is here. Thank you for coming, Sumaya. Thanks for having me, Yvonne. It's so great to be here with you, albeit virtually. I wish we could do this virtually. in person. Yes, Sumaya is hailing from London at uh, 9, 8 p.m., right? You're about 8 p.m. And I'm in California, so we're, you know, uh, afternoon and we are going to talk today about halal travel and this is a topic that you guys have heard a lot from me about since the time I was in Turkey and started really getting into the topic of traveling and then the whole concept of halal travel but Sumeya is the expert in this topic of halal travel so she's going to talk to us today about what that means and all the exciting things that are on the radar for halal travel and about her company Halal Travel Guide. But first, let me introduce you to her more formally and tell you all about who she is and what she is doing with Halal Travel Guide. Samaya Hamdi is the founder and managing director of Halal Travel Guide, the travel company making it easier for Muslims to enjoy much better travel experiences. Halal Travel Guide works in partnership with local hosts from around the world to host trips designed with adventure-seeking Muslims in mind, as well as offering free digital travel guides to help Muslims plan better independent trips. Halal Travel Guide recently launched their own instant booking platform with experiences including discovering the golden age of Islam in Uzbekistan, desert stargazing in Wadi Rum, road tripping with local Muslims in Barbados, and whitewater rafting in Bosnia. Samaya has been featured in numerous international publications, including The Guardian Observer, and the New York Times and is described as the entrepreneur redefining travel for millennial Muslims. Welcome, 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 Samia. We are so blessed to have you and I'm happy to call you my friend and colleague in the halal industry. Oh, what, what an introduction you want. Honestly, you're too kind. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And Alhamdulillah, it's you know, been so great to have the opportunity to connect with you and to share a lot of synergies about halal tourism because I think food is obviously very deeply connected in yes. halal tourism. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation actually. Yes. Well, Sumay and I met a couple of years ago in Istanbul at the World uh, World Halal Summit. Uh, we were both speakers there and it was the first time knowing you and knowing about your super interesting business. And then we started talking and I realized what a super interesting person you are. <laughs> and we just sort of hit it up and became fast friends and started to really talk about this intersection of food and travel, which we'll get to later on in the interview. Um, but Sumeya, tell everybody about your interesting business, how you got started in this, and then what is this concept of halal travel? Because a lot of people question like, why does, travel need to be halal what is mm -hmm. what does halal have to do with travel you're the expert and you can explain that to us yeah so i mean it's interesting because in some destinations like uh kind of south far southeast asia indonesia malaysia there's a full appreciation for halal travel but i've seen in kind of the uk europe us we haven't yet fully embraced uh the fact that there is a need for halal tourism and I think it's because we've just got used to quite low standards. So, I mean, halal travel essentially is everything that makes it easier for Muslims to travel better, right? And I think the top kind of priorities for Muslims traveling tend to be obviously halal food and then availability of prayer for prayer spaces, so mosques or prayer rooms, whether it's in airports or, you know, at the destination that you're visiting. But beyond that, you also want to feel welcome in the destination that you're visiting, particularly if you're visibly Muslim. Right. So that, I think this is particularly a big one for Muslim women. Mm -hmm. um, and you also want to have access to kind of family friendly activities, maybe segregated pools or beaches, um, services where you don't feel like it's not family friendly, this kind of thing. So there is definitely a big need for increasing halal tourism services. And in fact, um, there's been a huge growth in the last 10 years. I mean, you, you probably already heard of it already, Yvonne, but a, a lot of people are surprised when they hear that places like Japan and South Korea 
have spent the last few years really trying to improve the services that they provide to Muslim travelers so that more Muslims come and travel, which is why now you'll find in Korea, you can find a prayer space in train stations. You'll find much more halal restaurants. You'll find um, authentic halal Korean foods like beef bulgogi, um, kimchi, whatever. So they already recognize that there is a need uh, to cater to Muslims, much in the same way that people cater to vegetarian and, and this kind of thing and they're definitely fully embracing that so um, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity for us to learn to travel better and really how Halal Travel Guide started was um, it was 2015 I was on maternity leave I had my baby she was like six months less than six months at the time four months uh, me and my husband decided to go to Singapore and then do a road trip through Malaysia and then go on to South Korea and Japan and <laughs> Yeah, with baby, I know. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, um, traveling with kids for a lot of people seems off-putting, but it honestly opens a lot of doors for you. And people can be so friendly because they see your yeah. baby, especially in that region, because oh. Caucasian babies look so different. So they're like, oh, wow. And then it's a conversation starter, and all of a sudden you've got a new friend. But oh, I digress. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, you get to jump queues, like there are a lot of pugs. Yeah, well, you get to know a culture by how they treat their elderly and, and the children, right? Yes, so yeah. I think that's, that's super really friendly. Like um, South Korea, very, very friendly um, with yeah. my daughter. Singapore, Malaysia, like super friendly. And it was really nice to feel welcome and, and, sure. and in places that you may not necessarily feel welcome as the obvious uh, kind of minority. So right. it was on this trip actually that, we struggled to find halal food and we also struggled to find kind of local authentic halal food. And we were surprised to also experience this problem even in Malaysia, which is obviously majority Muslim country. You know, it wasn't that straightforward. You couldn't just turn up to a place and assume it was halal um, yeah. and assume that you'd enjoy the food. It just didn't work like that. So basically um, I started writing about the places that we had gone to and, and wrote travel guides basically to these destinations just to make it easier for the next person who came along yeah. so that they'd at least have some personal recommendations to go by that I didn't have. And then it was literally from there that Halal Travel Guide was born. Um, and then a couple of years later, I did a trip to Bosnia and really showcased the destination. And this was when Bosnia was starting to become much more popular as a destination because of the Islamic heritage. Uh, because it's much better value for money to visit in Europe compared to some of the nearby destinations. I mean, there's so many reasons to visit Bosnia. Sure. But um, we did like a big uh, kind of advertising campaign for Bosnia. And then after that, people started messaging saying, OK, it's great. You've shared the itinerary. You've shared these tips. But are you actually doing trips to Bosnia? Oh, so um, some advice to actually going to do it, which is a big leap. Um, sure. Uh, but we were fortunate because we have a wonderful local contact in Bosnia. And he said, I think you guys should host a trip and I'll do it in partnership with you. And we did. So 2018, we hosted our first trip to Bosnia and it was a huge success. And Alhamdulillah, since then, we've added on several more trips, several more experiences, more destinations. So now we go to Uzbekistan, we're going yeah. to Barbados, uh, we're going to uh, so many different places. And all of this is in partnership with local Muslim communities. And it's all about bridging those communities, bringing people together, um, sharing stories from our shared Islamic heritage, um, and just traveling in a way that's much better for me and you, and also much better for the destinations that you visit as well. Sure, sure. I, you know, it, it is interesting. Um, you mentioned Japan and Korea, and also there's Thailand, right? I, I mean, I know from a food perspective that I, just they're always always on my radar because of the options for halal food growing uh, in their airports and things like that. What what do you think is the reason that it's happening in Asia, in places that aren't necessarily Muslim centric? What what is the what's happening in those countries? There's a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. We know that already, but also. <laughs> the kind of average age of Muslims is under the age of 30. So you've got a very large proportion of young Muslims, many of whom have been uh, very well educated, they're working professionals, they've got money to spend, and they want to be able to travel and they want to be able to explore. And obviously kind of in the Asia region, you have a huge population of Muslims. I mean, Indonesia is home to the largest population of Muslims, mm -hmm. Malaysia as well. 
and um, it's I think it's been triggered by visits from Mal by Malaysians and Indonesians, but also oh, okay. to a certain extent, uh, visitors coming in from the Gulf mm -hmm. who have the money to spend and want to experience something different. So, so, so for proximity and uh, disposable income. Yeah, I mean, disposable income has a huge impact um, mm -hmm. because this market didn't exist 10 years ago. People would only have the money. Like if you're a diaspora Muslim living in the US or living in the UK, you'd spend your money and spend your summer at home, back home, right? That's where you'd go. But right. now it's not that it's not the case anymore. People are wanting to travel to different destinations. And in places like Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Thailand, you mentioned, they have been very forward thinking at literally embracing the opportunity. And they're like, hey, like we welcome this. We want Muslim travelers yeah. to come. They recognize that Muslim travelers expect high quality um, and high standards when it comes to food, when it comes to hygiene, mm -hmm. um, this kind of thing. And they're quite happy to provide those facilities. And, and you know, you'll know anyway, um, like in China, for example, halal has become um, a label associated with high quality products. So, there, there's a very different mentality towards halal compared to the mentality that you see in the UK, in Europe, in the US, where there hasn't been this embracing of anything halal, let alone halal tourism. Yes. There's it's a true. lot of apprehension, right? There's a lot of reluctance. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of that is uh, kind of Islamophobia, fear towards Muslims, the way that Muslims have been portrayed in the media in the last 20 years or so that they haven't received, we haven't received as much in Japan and in South Korea where they don't constantly have this bombardment of a particular type of portrayal of Muslims. Media plays a big role. Yeah, huge. Oh, wow, wow. That's a really interesting point because, you know, when I was writing my cookbooks and developing recipes for global cuisine, I would think, you know, hey, there's so many Muslims in France, for example. Uh, it would be pretty easy to make, you know, traditional French food halal or when you come to, when it comes to travel, you know, to guide people towards the places where there's more interesting halal food or, you know, where people could find services. But it seems like that never really blossomed. And I mean, for reasons you just explained, it's just so interesting that a place I never really thought of, Japan, for example, or Thailand, would 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 not only just be receptive, but like basically roll out the red carpet you know that's that's amazing and there, and there is kind of a lot of overlap in terms of culture you know the sort of the cleanliness the manners it's really interesting um and i'm, I'm happy I, that's those are on my bucket list of places japan korea for sure so i'm excited about they're that. amazing places especially like food wise yeah yeah so different you think you might ever create trips in those places Oh, yeah, absolutely. Inshallah. I mean, it was my hope before the pandemic to go to Korea and do mm. a research trip um, and, and put an itinerary together. Um, but inshallah, definitely soon. Um, we've actually just published um, a travel guide to Tokyo. And there's like, we explore a lot of the food in there because food is one of the best ways that you can experience the local culture, right? Yes. Yeah. And oh, before, definitely. You'd definitely. think I can't try it because it's not halal. Uh, right. But now that's just right. not the case and you have so many options. And that's the thing I love about what you do is that you're 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 taking these places that um, even that are visibly Muslim, let's say Tur Turkey and Uzbekistan, and you're you're highlighting certain aspects of the of the local region to even make the Muslim travelers excited to go and interested in going a little deeper. Um, and that's really important. I know you, you already we have a lot of fans of Turkey here, but, so I have to mention that. Um, you do have a few trips going on in Turkey and then we have some things planned, but what is it that you can do in a Muslim country that um, makes things more exciting for people rather than they can say, oh, I already know about that. I already know that history. What is it about the Islamic heritage that you sort of pull out and make interesting for people? So I think the way that we Muslim travelers in general approach traveling to a Muslim country is that we we assume that there's not that much need to plan ahead or do that much research because you're in a in the land where mosques are readily available, where halal food is readily available, and you know that's pretty much it, right? So we don't, I think, do put as much effort in um, in researching or 
investing that time and in, in looking into things as deeply. But also, I find that um, Muslims in general are quite reluctant to hire local tour guides. I don't know why. I think it's something that we need to get used to and get around to because, yeah. and I myself am guilty of this. I should say, like I myself, five years ago in Istanbul, I had a local tour guide approach me when I was outside the Hagia Sophia. And I just said like, you know, thank you, maybe next time. I'll just like read up on it for now. And he's like, it's not the, it's not the same. And honestly, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it took me about seven trips to Istanbul before I did my first walking tour. And genuinely, within the first two hours of that walking tour, I learned more about Istanbul than I had in the six trips previously. Wow. And it just brings everything to life. Like it has yeah. so much more meaning. I think some of us, you know, I myself am guilty of that too, where I feel like, no, 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 I want to be off the beaten path and do my own thing and be like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> but mean, you can do that better with a local tour guide, right? Because they're the I ones who know the hidden that. spots. I, yeah. I really didn't really realize that until talking with you. Because, But you also pick the right people. I think that's that's what it amounts to, too, is like somebody who really knows what they're talking about. They, and they're passionate about that history. Uh, you know, I, honestly, Alhamdulillah, we've been really fortunate in that we've just managed to connect with some amazing people. I can't take credit for it, them because these are all people that have studied for years and like mm. their passion is just written on their faces when they tell you their stories. Like um, yeah. the, one of the local guys that we work with in, in Istanbul, his name's Haktan and he is just brilliant. Like he can roll off stories about uh, Mimar Sinan so easily and he brings them to life so that when you enter a mosque like the Suleymaniye, for example, and you're admiring its beauty, he takes you so much deeper and he literally transports you back 400 or so years and shares stories about Sinan and his kind of cheeky ways and wow. with the Sultan. And it just make, changes the whole thing. And it really just, it's it's so immersive. And I can't, it's hard to explain unless you're there with him. It's, a good word. it's so much fun. And you can't get these kind of stories from any tour guide. Like you said, it's only mm -hmm. ones that are willing to acknowledge um islamic history and muslim contributions to islamic history and how that all ties in with the wider uh context mm -hmm. of everything else that's taken place so a, a same yeah. thing in andalusia right um mm -hmm. yeah hambra is the most visited monument in the world i think if i'm not mistaken and people go through it every day thousands of people go through it every day and they don't know that it's quran that they're looking at on the walls which yeah. is Right? Shame, right you've yeah. made all the effort to go there and then you're not actually connecting with the history of this building yes it's beautiful to look at that's that's mm -hmm. lovely but on a deeper level why do you have surat al-mulk in certain places above the throne of yes. the sultan and, and what yeah. does that signify and how does that tie in with you know so many other things and it just brings the whole thing to life when you have someone who can share mm -hmm. their research and their years of experience with you it's not enough to just go and be there. I mean, I think there's a time and place to to go to a location and soak it in, you know, spend some time. But it, you're right that you appreciate it so much more when you understand those little details that, you know, you can flip through a, a travel book and you can read, okay, this, this happened. But it's not the same as somebody who's giving you information from their heart and their hard-earned, you know, studying and, and, and those little details that, you know, you're just not going to get unless somebody um, local, somebody invested in the culture and who really, truly wants people to learn and appreciate and go back home and, and tell others about that, too. I think that, that education part of it is um, the, the, the richness that we take home with us, right? Yeah, that's the bit that transforms you, I think, because you can go to a destination and have a really nice time and do all the bucket list experiences and, and visit all the famous attractions. But you'll come home feeling like you had a break, you had a nice change of scenery, but that's it. And then there are some trips where you you come back and you genuinely feel transformed, like you've unlocked something within yourself that you didn't know needed unlocking. Maybe it's a new passion. Maybe it's something that yeah. you've learned about yourself. And, and then that's how you really start. And that's traveling, right? That's taking yes. it to a new level. Yes. Isn't that the reason why, you know, I I used to feel like travel was an escape, you know, from, from like when I was younger. I was like, oh, it's just an escape from the day-to-day -day 
you know, you get to explore a new place. It's exciting. But the, as I get older, I feel like traveling to places is more, um, it's more uh, soul touching. It's more something like, you know, you're not looking for something, but you're, 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 you're looking to uh, help yourself be transform, transformed uh, by, by the place, you know, like places affect you, right? The people affect you, the food, mm -hmm. everything. We're looking to experience the magic in a way, you know, that we don't get at home. Um, but also, you know, I think that's why things are changing in terms of the, the type of travel people want, right? It's not just going and seeing whatever is quote unquote touristy anymore. It's about the experiences that people want experiences, right? They want food that is homemade, handmade, artisan, you know, they want, um, you know, little bits and pieces of the local culture that they're never going to find, um, you know, without having taken the leap into these neighborhoods or, you know, back streets of Istanbul, for whatever it is, you know, I think that the travel groups that I'm part of, I, I'm, you know, I'm seeing that that's what people are looking for. Would you agree that that's the trend we're moving towards? Definitely. I think um, the pandemic has accelerated it. It was it's oh. happened, it was happening before the pandemic where like I think if you kind of look at travel and tourism of the last six decades or so, it's grown immensely, um, kind of like unprecedented in human history. Ha has it been possible for so many people to just zip around the world? Um, in aeroplanes so easily yeah. whereas you know exactly. these trips you know like you mentioned Ibn Batuta to me before right he traveled for years like yes. working sometimes mm -hmm. um, so it's completely unprecedented and what we've seen in travel and tourism over the last 60 years or so is that it hasn't really benefited local destinations that much actually mm -hmm. it's caused a lot of harm um, right. to local communities uh, right. to kind of cultural heritage uh, the environment yeah, um, one. yeah and it's yeah it's a shame really because in actual fact travel and tourism has the potential to literally solve or help to solve all 17 of these sustainable development goals you know like um, employing local people especially women especially young people sure. preserving cultural heritage um, you know for example when you pay to do I don't know a plov making masterclass in Uzbekistan or when you pay to learn how they do the uh, atlas silk weaving in Uzbekistan, you're right. doing your little bit, you're having an amazing experience and you're also helping to preserve that intangible cultural heritage, which is so important. So we're gonna see a lot more interest in experiences where people can feel like they're connected, where they feel like they've learned something, um, where they feel like maybe they can go home and try something a little bit new, whether it's something artistic, whether it's a research, reading, whatever it is. For sure, I think uh, across the board, you know, this disconnect, this connection that we felt during the pandemic, mm -hmm. people now want to come back and feel like my life, I can build more purpose into my life. And one of the best mm -hmm. ways that you can do that is, is through travel and by having Definitely. these authentic experiences that draw you closer to the local community and mm -hmm. bring you in because like it's, there's nothing more special I think than going to a destination where you don't have any blood relatives there and they make you feel like you're at home yes. and, and that's what we get in Bosnia like when we take people <laughs> there each and every time our local guides just make you feel like you've joined a new family and it's so special yeah I think um you really turned me on to Bosnia. I, I mean, I never really thought of it as a travel destination. I mean, I have friends from Bosnia, um, but I, 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 I really never knew um, that it would it would be a place that we could navigate as tour. I just didn't, never crossed my mind, and you really opened me up to that. And I, I think um, just backtracking for a second, our conversations about food have really um, given a lot of perspective to me about, you know, this combination of food and travel. I mean, I always loved, I would go to destinations basically for the food. But for example, um, when it came to Bosnia, you, you opened up my mind to some of the really unique foods that are there that, I mean, I, I thought of like the boriks and the pastries, but you were telling me about 
you know, the green juices and you were telling me, you know, you would love the, the scenery and the, the naturalness of it. So this sort of marriage of food and travel <laughs> is something we've been talking about for a long time now. And um, that's given us some ideas for places. I mean, I, after I was living in Turkey for a while, we talked about, you know, doing a culinary tour there. We're not there yet because of the pandemic, but um, we've had some interesting conversations that you recorded on your podcast. So I would like you to just let us know. I'm going to put a link in the comments of where people can follow your podcast because I know I'm not the only one you interviewed, but there's, I'm sure, lots of interesting discussions there. So can you tell us how people can listen to that? Yes. So um, if you you can find it on any platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, wherever. Um, it's, it's called A Better Way to Travel. And it kind of encapsulates the theme that we're trying to get into, which is helping Muslims to travel better um, in a way that benefits you as the traveler and also the local destination that you're visiting, the local people, the local community. And what we've done is we've done season one in which we got a selection of local tour guides from around the world. Um, we, we went to Kenya, we did Andalusia, we did Barbados, um, we did Bosnia and we did Istanbul. And we've done just uh, perspectives of these destinations that maybe you haven't heard of before that you're not that familiar with because like a place like Istanbul is so iconic yes. uh, and then there are still so many stories that people don't know about it so sure. Um, sure. how could you you know you can go to Istanbul like you you said seven times and you're six times <laughs> and not so but I mean, I mean, that's because of my ignorance, because I think if I had the first time gone with a local guy, not just a local, but like an expert local who's read up on this stuff, then at least the next six times I would have learned a lot more each time. So it's you can make your life easier depending on how you choose to travel. And that's what I wanted to encapsulate in the podcast, because, yeah, you can go to any destination by yourself and you can do everything yourself. That's fine. But you can literally take your experience to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. because when you work with a local expert who has spent years um, learning about the local destination and building connections, whether it's with uh, local artisans or restaurateurs or um, accommodation providers, they can open doors for you that you just can't open yourself as a traveler who's maybe just going through for a week or for a few days. So um the podcast is like a nice kind of mini tour series. If you're looking to do a mini virtual tour, it's a better way to travel. And yeah, you can find it on all platforms. And um, me and Yvonne have done a mini series, which will be season two. Yes. And Charlotte's going to be released in the autumn. And it's going to be looking into this kind of uh, the crossroads between halal food and halal travel, which I'm very excited to, yeah. to share with everyone. Yeah, we've, we've got some interesting things on the radar. I think... Um, you know, my experience living in, in Turkey and being part of the local community, I was, you know, very passionate and excited and, you know, kind of shared that with you. And so I think we might have found some open ground to break and and uh, to get people to come and to really experience a different kind of, of Turkey outside of Istanbul, outside of the big cities. And we hope to be able to do that. I mean, and you're you're so receptive and open to those ideas. And I think um, you, you seem to really also get a good team of people together to, to do your tours. So um, you don't, you know, take it all on yourself. And, you know, I think you just, you operate in a really productive and smart way. So I highly encourage people to, you know, visit your website. And I posted the link uh, in the comments. So those of you who can't travel right now or are not feeling comfortable to travel, there's still ways to benefit from your website. You want to tell us, like, if people aren't interested in going on tours right now, what can they learn from your, your information on your website? Yeah, so our website, um, we've got two sections. So we've got the trip section where you can have a read up on our trips and we've got dates in there for 2022 for people who want to plan ahead. Um, but we also wanted it to be a free resource um, to genuinely just be of service to the Muslim community because it's still so hard to find uh, reliable um, information to inspire you about where to go, to inform you about places that you should go to and to visit. So we've got a lot of resources on there exploring Islamic heritage. So um, we have a, a hashtag campaign actually called Own Your Narrative. And I started this one in 2017. 
and it was after I came back from a tour with a local Spanish Muslim community in Andalusia. And I was just completely blown away by this like local Spanish Muslim community who are reviving their heritage and their history that's pretty much been suppressed for the last 400 years since the Spanish Inquisition and bringing it to life through these walking tours. And it really inspired me to help other Muslims to uh, find a way to reconnect with, with their identity, with their heritage, because all of this feeds into identity. And like myself growing up as a young Muslim, uh, you know, kind of a, a teenager and post 9-11 climate, you're not exactly inspired by what you see of Muslims on TV as a Muslim, let alone as a non-Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. So to then ha get access, because, um, you know, this, these stories exist, but they're not, a lot of them aren't in English or they haven't been translated. Yeah. So online. You, don't, you, yeah, don't you really can't find them. them. Like, it's, it's very difficult. This, this, these stories have been buried, but like right here in Europe, um, on my doorstep, I have access to centuries worth of Islamic heritage, um, you know, in Bosnia and Andalusia. And it's a, a game changer for me because all of a sudden I feel like I have a heritage that I can connect to um, in, in places that otherwise I feel like I have no connection to. And the beauty yeah. of that is it doesn't matter if you're Pakistani or you're uh, Palestinian, you're Algerian, you're Nigerian, wherever you're from, by virtue of our shared faith, we all have um, a right and an interest in this Islamic heritage. So yeah, yes, that's exactly. what I find so inspiring. Yeah, I think that the stories that we read about in Islamic history, uh, if you can go and visit those places, it becomes really exciting to kind of, and it's a good opportunity for people to take their children to, to learn, you know, a, a, you, you learn about it in the books, but when you can go and, and visit these places, it's just a lifetime, it's an opportunity of a lifetime to do. I personally felt very connected to what you do because I have, you, you know, I wasn't raised Muslim, but my heritage is Sicilian and Spanish or Hispanic, which goes back to Andalusia because I've done the DNA test, so I know. <laughs> and it's so interesting because I feel like going back to those places and digging a little deeper, um, it's, it's, it helps me understand my culture, number one. It helps me understand myself, my family, why we do certain things we do. But I think it's good for people to know a little bit more about who they are if they have personal, um, you know, personal bloodline that goes back to, for example, Andalusia or Italy or whatever. It's, it's interesting for people to learn more at the source, you know, and today, uh, that's more possible than it was maybe 20 years ago. I think yeah. 20 years ago, I was in Spain as a student a long time ago. I'm not going to age myself here. But um, going to Andalusia, you really wouldn't get the information you would get today. Um, I mean, it wasn't there. It wasn't. Even now, Yvonne, like um, even now, Andalusia, you can't find this information by and large um, from the local tour guides. And that's one of the reasons why. So Yassin, um, he's excellent. He started his own company called Ilim Tours. Um, one of the reasons why he started his business is because he's similar to you, actually, in that he's uh, of Latin American descent, I think Cuban and his mother's Italian. And then they moved back to Spain and so he grew up there all his life pretty much and he living in andalusia which is like the heart of this islamic heritage that he never learned about at school right, um, right. he's got the alhambra on his doorstep and he's like well why don't i know any of this stuff this is my heritage it's also part of my national um history and yet yeah. i don't know it and so it's not that they've started to share it more, um, Yvonne, it's that local Muslims are literally having to dig it out themselves. So like pilling, oh, wow. putting the pieces together themselves uh, based on reading in different areas, digging up old yeah. manuscripts, this kind of thing. Those are gems of our community. It's yeah. Totally gems. I mean, I, I went through this experience with um, when I went to Istanbul and I was looking for cookbooks of the Ottoman period. I wanted to dig deeper into what, what did they really make during the Ottoman Empire? You know, yes, you have recipes from the like the Sultan's palace and stuff, but very few. And there there just wasn't a lot because history tells us that a lot of things were burned, you know, destroyed. But there are people who have done the work and you have to kind of dig them out and you have to figure out who they are and 
you know, maybe it's in Turkish and not in English. So if you really want to know something, I think you, you really have to invest in those yeah. uh, people who yeah, have been absolutely. there. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's amazing that you know them and, and that you're working with them. And I interestingly enough, we, we did a, a, a presentation for World Travel Association about halal travel, halal and food, halal food and travel, um, to a non-Muslim audience. And there was so much interest in in our community, our travelers, halal. Where do you think that's stemming from? I mean, I think it starts off with the fact that people are curious. Um, halal has got a bad rap uh, in the UK, US, Europe in general because of yeah. misinformation. But um, it's inevitable that businesses and destinations are noticing that the Muslim pound or the Muslim dollar is becoming increasingly powerful. And you'll have seen, right, that kind of uh, five, five or ten years ago, Ramadan would pass the supermarkets by and no one would notice. And now all of a sudden you've got the supermarkets yeah. doing big Ramadan campaigns, right, yeah. and sales and that kind of thing. And Yeah, I've been... People, yeah. Before you know it, they'll be on to the Hajjah and Muharram and all the right, holy months right. of the year because they recognise that right. there is a market that is underserved and they and they want to serve it. So I've seen it in the food industry, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, thirteen years ago, it was like, what? What's halal and what is Ramadan? I mean, that was like a whole nother question mark. But you know, step by step. <laughs> yeah. Me. When when one big retailer jumps on board and says hey we we're in this i mean they've done their market research so they know they know what's viable um and when they go forward others tend to follow but it still seems like we have a long way to go in food we and do was... I, we do i think it's it's sort of like how um i think my worry for halal tourism is that we are going to copy what we've seen in the global travel and tourism market mm -hmm. rather than looking to our faith and the principles within our own faith to build something uh, that's organic and, and that embodies Islam holistically, because yeah. we've seen that the, the pause in the tra in travel that's been caused by the pandemic. Uh, you've seen places like Venice, New Zealand, massively popular tourist destinations have been like, well, hang on a minute. Actually, all those tr travelers that we've been getting, yeah, like financially, they've been very beneficial, but they've caused a lot of damage to right. our like, communities, right. to our like, environment. We don't want to go back to that. We don't want them like in yeah. Venice. They've said no, like no cruise ships no in, cruise our, in our in lagoon. Like we will not. Take respect them. to them for that. Totally. Yeah, good. and they, they've got structural damage they have to deal with. Um, you know, you know everything. Yeah. I mean, the living thing. there, mm -hmm. it must be so hellish just having to tackle go down your road right, and you're like ambushed by tourists wherever yeah. you go. That's that's the thing with tourist destinations. They can just be you know, economically uh, great for a few months, but then, you know, you're left with a lot of, if the, if the destinations aren't prepared to deal with the growth, the quick uh, toll that it takes on the environment. I, like I've read about, um, uh, there's a Tulum and Playa del Carmen in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I was there during my college days and those places were pristine and gorgeous and inexpensive, but they were environmentally, beautiful and the pictures i see now i've not been back but they have trouble with the water pollution they they couldn't sustain such so many tourists in such a short time that got packed in there and all the growth and development that the now like the reef is is being damaged and the sea life is is hurting it, it's sad but you know the local economy needs it but how much of that how much of that local economy actually benefits is also a question. This is it. This is you, literally you hit the nail on the head. Um, tourism leakage is a huge issue because you get yeah. international corporations coming in, with, yeah. especially um, with resorts, uh, mm -hmm. uh, multi-chain hotels. They mop up the money and then the locals don't benefit that much at all, to be honest. And in fact, in some cases, in some destinations, you'll find you'll have these like massive sprawling um, places, like, I don't know, with a thousand rooms. And then tourists are literally told, do not leave these premises because it's not safe for you to go out and be in the local environment. And I mean, a- Traveling 
there. <laughs> this is it. And it's literally this going back to this idea of having an escape as opposed to going to experience something completely different. Right, and right. It, we've been sold the lie that we need to go and escape on a beach for five days. I mean, right. let's be honest, yeah. you get bored after day three. And then exactly. you want to start and doing stuff, right? It's old to try to escape from your life, you know, like have a life that you don't need to escape from, but you you go to places because you actually want to, you know, enhance your life, not just you hear a different language, right? Yeah, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Try different food and just, you know, meet different people. And you learn so I feel so I feel literally richer after having gone to places. It's not about money at all. It's it's just those experiences. And I feel like there's so few places left where that's available anymore. And and you made a really good point about um you know I'm not I'm not going to uh, be able to say exactly what you said but basically what it boils down to is are we going to keep our ethics in line as muslims and expand this whole halal travel concept in ways that doesn't uh sell our soul for money in a way. I mean I hope that we will look to, like like I said look to our own principles because you know right. when we look at our own principles we see that there is an aversion to like monopolies in mm -hmm. in Islamic societies. We sure. we're yeah. supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be entrepreneurial. We're supposed to be yeah. business minded. We're supposed to be go getters. Point. With a balance, you know, like you know sure. how you see like companies now have corporate social responsibility as a key thing for all companies, but it's like a side a side thing that isn't yeah. part and parcel of the company itself. Whereas when we look at Islamic principles this notion of corporate social responsibility is literally at the core of the business itself because you have to make sure that when you're doing business you're not doing any harm to the people in your right. supply chain uh you know you're not harming their homes their local environment you're paying a fair price you're paying on time and these are issues that we see time and again in business um whether it's in travel and tourism whether it's in the food industry oh, it's um, and if we we do it properly and build like halal tourism from the ground up holistically really purely based on islamic principles i genuinely think that we would be able to offer a model for the global travel and tourism market to look at and say this is actually a sustainable way of growing tourism and and something that we can all adopt and you you could just replace everything you said about travel with food and i feel the same way it's the same exact thing you know we see a lot of halal uh, uh, products, but are they healthy? Are they sustainable? Are, what, is the supply, what does the supply chain look like? Are the animals being treated? It's that whole holistic thing you're talking about, the domino effect. If one thing goes wrong, that's all kind of unhealthy or unsustainable. And, and I think um, you, you just hit the nail on the head and I hope that um, people look to you for modeling more um, programs, itineraries, projects in the halal travel space, because you, you you really really said it perfectly the way it's supposed to be done and i don't I think, think it's utopia i think that's doable it is i think like you know honestly i can't take credit because it's all about working with locals and alhamdulillah i've been blessed with wonderful local people to work with and it's through them that i've learned so much more about how to approach designing a trip and how to approach visiting a destination like yeah. um you know how to do so in a way that is respectful to the people that we're visiting um respectful of them as as people who have a lot to give us and who are opening their doors to us and enabling us to come and and have these and build these connections so right it's just about kind of working in partnership taking into account what locals have to say what benefits them what mm -hmm. has the potential to cause harm and then thinking, okay, so how can I build something? How might I build a, a travel company that helps Muslims to connect with their identity through travel and that also benefits the local destination? How might I build a travel company that um, is, is beneficial and, and builds bridges between communities from all over the world, between Muslims from all over the world? And I think we can genuinely do that with Halal Travel Guide. And that's my dream. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress. Nice. You're, you're a great model for lots of reasons, you know, not just in the travel space, but in the entrepreneurial space, because every business should be taking those things into account anyway, you know. So so there, there's a lot more coming from you in the future, I know, inshallah. Inshallah, I hope so, inshallah. So, I mean, inshallah. 
so now we're looking at inshallah post covid right now we're hopefully getting to the end of this uh this looking better and i know there's been so many travel restrictions and you being in the uk it's been really frustrating because you guys have been like not able to go to a lot of places it's so frustrating um but there's hope right there's places to go soon and and uh what do you think this post-COVID world of travel is going to look like? Where are people going to want to go? What kind of things are they going to want to do? And how has that changed from before the pandemic? So I think we're going to see that um, people want to do staying in one destination rather than city or country hopping because of the different restrictions that you get at the borders. I think people will be more reluctant to take indirect flights again for the same reason they'll be yeah, wanting to take direct flights so they might stay a bit closer to home especially mm -hmm. if kind of restrictions change at the last minute they might feel you know i'd rather do a staycation or travel right. to a destination that's close to me i mean it really varies because <laughs> there's such a variety of some places like i think americans right you guys can go anywhere pretty much anywhere and we're well we have changing rules every week pretty much it feels like yeah, it's really odd it's I, yeah i, I, I see abreast of those things and i'm like I, I can't believe uk is is like that but there must be we've opened up a bit so like they created this traffic light system and now they have since pretty much reneged on half of the traffic light system oh to my God. in effect you know, so that you can you can more or less travel a bit more now Oh, good, good. I yeah. have to be honest, if I, I was looking at flights to, to Turkey and a friend of mine, she found a really cheap flight from LA to Istanbul. It was like 500 bucks, but she said, but yeah, you just have to go through London. And I was like, no, I'm not going through London. You know, oh, well, what you just said, because I was like, what if things close? I'm not going to, you know, be stuck in I mean, you want to get to your destination, you know, you don't want to be. Well, well, actually, so earlier this week, um, our government announced that fully vaccinated US travellers are now able to come to the UK and you don't have to quarantine. So, oh, so I could actually come and see you. Yes, yes, <laughs> you could. could. No, because for the longest time, it was like for like just iffy, right? You know, you yeah, know, yeah, iffy. yeah, it has been it. iffy. It has and been. I, I, you know, the thing is, when I came back from Turkey and I, I, I self quarantined in the US in a hotel, and it's expensive. You cannot, mm. you know, nobody wants to, you know, have that added travel expense when you're, you know, trying to get to a destination, yeah. you know, and the time and everything. So I think you're right about you. You couldn't have said it better though about the direct flights because I was like, you know, it could be a cheap ticket, but then you end up paying all this money in like hotels yeah. and stuff. So forget it and. I got and stuck you, in London once and it was super draining on the budget. I <laughs> mean, it's the, city. <laughs> the other thing as well is like the PCR tests, because yeah. for some destinations, yeah. you still have to take a PCR test, even if you're yeah. vaccinated. And you know, because they're like 72 or 48 hours, right. depending yeah. on how long your flight is, you might land and have to take another test before you go yeah. on to the next destination. Yeah. So it's That's a funny. bit more logistics. And I think yeah. this is, all the more reason to work with a travel designer or with a travel company yeah. that can make this easier for you, but also help you to have a lot more assurance when you do your bookings. Yeah. You know, a lot of people lost their money from their bookings during the pandemic and it's not on. And you do need someone yeah. to kind of advocate on your behalf sometimes. Right. And they know they, they have experience working with the airlines, working with everything. They, they, they're experienced. They can give you lots of advice and help and, I, I used to want to do everything myself, and now I'm kind of thinking, you know, after working with you, talking with you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming less stubborn about all of that. I think it's a, it's a really good thing, and you know, especially if you're a woman traveling, uh, you know, to a group, but you're going alone to that group or something, you know, you really want to be have some more assurances that um, you're going to be taken care of, you're going to be okay, you're going to be safe, you're going to be, um, you know, not not stuck somewhere that you didn't expect to be. So. Things are things are changing, but I think we've learned a lot about travel and about different destinations during the pandemic. As as ironic as that sounds, because we were holed up at home, but I think those of us who love to travel were kind of tuned in and tapped into the what was happening in travel. Every restriction, every yeah. you know test, and um, things like that. So, you know, I, I now now hopefully things will get less complicated 
I'm hoping. So there's there's optimism on the on the horizon. So I mean, I feel like to be honest, it's still a long way to go because unfortunately a lot of countries haven't successfully secured vaccinations uh, or started vaccination programs and we're fortunate because we have governments that have been i think quite greedy um and self-interested but that's you know that's just what you would expect of your government to kind of purchase a whole bunch of vaccinations and then yeah. uh, other people are left behind so i think you know the key now is to get these vaccinations rolled out to as many destinations as possible to really start to give people confidence again to to travel yeah and it depends and people need to be aware of you know the vaccination that that they have had if they're vaccinated versus what's acceptable in the country they're going yeah because of their some countries are requiring boosters now um, yeah. countries are outright saying that certain other countries vaccinations don't count um it can get it can get hairy Right. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's a whole of pharmaceutical. Oh, like yeah, that's a whole other discussion. But, but it's all part of you know. Once you leave your home, you got to know a lot of things about destinations that you're traveling to. So, so um, you know, are, are these the kind of things that you are you writing about on Hello Travel Guide, or you're talking about, or you mention on social media? Do you? Do yeah, you I mean, this one's tricky because it really depends on where you're based. So we've done kind of some general tips on. Um, how to fly safely in the new normal, like how to be prepared, uh, what to pack, what to expect, um, you know, like turning up a lot earlier at the airport, just taking into yeah. account delays, that kind of thing. Um, we did do a few updates. On, I think updating the restrictions is just pointless because they're changing all yeah, the time. Yeah, changing all the time. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're just trying to keep people kind of optimistic and inspired, which is why we, we started the podcast during the pandemic, actually, because... Awesome. We want people to feel like they've got places that they can dream about right. visiting, inshallah, when, yeah. it's, when it's possible to do so. Armchair, armchair travel has always been a thing anyway, right? Mm -hmm. why, were, why were the Rick Steves um, you know, travel shows so popular when people didn't even go to those places, but they just you know, felt like they could travel by sitting? You know, so yeah, we did what we could do during the pandemic. And I think that uh, your podcast is going to be you know, very interesting for people to, to listen to. But... The danger is then you want to go everywhere that you talk about in your podcast. So, so what's the first destination you are planning to go to after all of these restrictions are lifted or you're ready to go? So inshallah, um, hopefully Bosnia. Inshallah. So, I mean, the plan is, so we actually have a, a trip to Bosnia coming up um, in like two weeks. Nice. Um, it would be the first kind of, trips since the pandemic started i mean we were really strict we decided not to host any trips yeah um during the pandemic and we've only started now because um you know a lot of our guests are now vaccinated so we decided now would be a good time to do any and cases are starting to fall so yeah inshallah bosnia inshallah barbados next and um, we're hoping to go ahead with uzbekistan in the autumn um so we're feeling optimistic and we've you know we're taking kind of uh, precautionary measures um, to make sure that people feel safe, they feel comfortable. And the most important thing is that, um, you know, they have just as an amazing time as they did before the pandemic. Sure, sure. I would like to go to all of those places and more with you. You're super interesting. And uh, you, the things that you've just, you're designing are just, I think, very, very unique. So uh, we'll be putting more links up for people to follow you on Instagram and Facebook. And where else are you? Twitter. Mainly Instagram and Facebook. That's all I can manage at the moment. We're on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, you want to be on the Instagram and the website yeah. as well. And the website. Okay. Well, any last tips you would like any to share with our audience about traveling or about, uh, you know, anything related to what you do? Um, I'd say if you're thinking of traveling soon or you're already kind of just dreaming about planning your next trip, be really intentional about what you want to get out of your trip. Maximize what you can get out of it in the sense of, are you going to just kind of have a break? Are you going to seek knowledge? Are you going to to feel a bit of transformation? Why are you going? And I really think about that and think about how then you can make facilitate your trip so that you achieve that goal. Because if you're going to go to the hassle of traveling somewhere, um, flying, you, you know, spending all that money, make sure that uh, you've done it right. Um, and definitely, I would say 100%, um, 
wherever you go, uh, at least have one walking tour with a local guide, build that connection, build that relationship, get that open door so that you have someone who can give you tips on where to eat halal local food, yeah. where you should avoid the tourist traps, how to haggle responsibly, so many things. So yeah, but my number one tip would be just be really intentional about, intentional about what you're doing and connect with the local in advance of your trip. So, so you set yourself up with a friend. Right, intentional travel, conscious travel, conscious living, that's all very, um, you know, sort of trendy to talk about, but I hope that's a trend that stays because it, it's um, important, whether it's about travel or food or life in general, but uh, they can get kind of all of it on your on your trips. So that's very exciting. Well, I think we have a lot to look forward to by following you and seeing what you come up with next. And I personally hope that we have more conversations here that we can share with, with our audiences. So thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy mom and a busy entrepreneur. So appreciate you taking the time to come here in your evening so thank you so no much. thank you it's been really enjoyable it's always enjoyable speaking with you Yvonne so thank you so much for hosting me and I Absolutely. hope next inshallah I'll be hosting you yes inshallah anytime I'm I'm there all right well if you guys still have questions please feel free to add them in the comments there will be a replay on YouTube at youtube.com slash my hello kitchen and you can follow Sumeya on her website, hellotravelguide.net. And then on Instagram, are you Halal Travel Guide or is it short? Halal Travel Guide? Yeah, you can find Halal Travel Guide. My personal profile is, is too long to say. So just go on Halal Travel Guide and you'll find me there somewhere. All right. And I tag you quite a bit too. So people can also find uh, your story. Oh, yeah, that's through true. My yeah. Page too. So, uh, but anyway, if you guys have questions, please continue to ask them and we'll forward them on to Sumaya. But thank you so much, Sumaya. This has been awesome. And, uh, Hope you can come again soon. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.